This podcast is brought to you by Startup Socials, a global community of entrepreneurs built to connect and empower people in the startup ecosystem. Hello, everybody. This is uh, Igor Shaifot, and this is uh, the wonderful and uh, only uh, very much imitated, talked about, but never quite replicated <laughs> Startup Socials. Um, podcast and i'm your strange but uh, usually exciting host igor shifot and uh we're interviewing pretty exciting people and uh, right now we're interviewing talia and uh, Talia will tell you about herself and about uh, the three-day rule and other things. We completely did not prepare her for what awaits. <laughs> so, so hopefully this will be fun to everybody. Talia, please take it away and uh, you know tell us whatever you think we should we should or should not know about you and your wonderful businesses. Okay, great. Um, so I run a company. It's called Three Day Rule, and we're a personalized matchmaking company. So we do everything for you. So let's say you're our client, and I don't know if you're single, but we should talk about it after. Then you come to us and tell us what you're looking for. We do an interview with you. And then after we go back and we find perfect matches for you, and we just deliver them. So you do no work. You hang out with your friends. You go to the gym, and you have a wing woman 24-7 doing all the work for you. So we are the opposite of online dating sites, although we work really closely with them. That sounds really fantastic. I, uh, I, I think I'll definitely let all my single men, and I suppose women, know <laughs> and right, women. about and women. this opportunity. Um, uh, talked with a lot of entrepreneurs who uh, started something in dating, and some of them reached quite significant audiences. My understanding is that this is one of the most um, challenging segments because uh, most well for two reasons correct me if i'm wrong one reason is because everybody thinks it's super simple you just uh, create a database match people ask what their interests uh, locations etc are you match them and bingo you got business which i'm sure is not that easy um, and, and the second thing is uh, people, for some strange reason, do not believe that there are, well, this is connected with the first one, they do not believe that there are significant barriers to entry. They somehow think that this critical mass that is necessary for a network to work, they can create it. So can you tell us how exactly you guys are tackling that? And uh, I, I very much understand what sets you apart, but how do you guys manage to successfully run a business and and I did hear about you from quite a few people yes so there are I think about 5,000 dating apps um, in the App Store right now so you're right everybody tries to start a dating app and everybody thinks they know that they have the secret um, we started the company a few years ago I started it while I was working at true Hollywood story as a television producer and everybody I knew was single so I was matching my coworkers, and I managed to find a lot of success with matching. So from there, we started hosting singles events around town. The first one, we had 20 people in Santa Monica. And within a few months, we were hosting parties for 300 people and then 600 people. So at one of the events, I looked around, and I saw hundreds of successful and attractive, really fun singles. And I realized that there was something missing in the market. So at that point, I quit my job and I started a matchmaking company. So we've been doing it for a few years now. And it took a lot of time. The company grew just by word of mouth. But we would crash medical conferences and go to real estate events and find all these amazing singles in town. So it definitely was not overnight. I think it's really difficult to just turn something on and start getting a lot of users. We worked really hard to build a great base to start from. And then when we took on a client, it was really easy for us to match them because we had this amazing pool of people to start with. And then from there, we added a lot of technology on the back end to, in order to scale the business. Because one issue with matchmaking is it's really difficult to scale because you have to meet everybody in person. So we built all this technology on the back end that helped us scale. So things like facial recognition technology, 
we found over time that people have types. So we ask all of our clients to send us photos of their exes, and we can run it through the system and find other people that look like their exes. Um, so by adding all this other technology, we've been able to scale. And then we also partnered with Match.com, and we work with a few other dating sites as well. And that has given us a big boost, um, and we have a much larger pool to pull from now. Uh, very interestingly, as you were talking about how you put together the first party and just a few dozens of people came and then uh, you grew to hundreds and then the business was up and running, uh, this reminded me of Mike Arrington's story about how tech, um, uh, tech crunch uh, mm -hmm. uh, started. Famously, he, he, he told this, I don't, I don't remember if it was some show where he told the story or he wrote about it, but basically he was drinking beer after some party and uh, felt pretty unhappy that there was nothing really good to read about <laughs> tech and innovation. And he just put together like a little, from what I remember, like a little manifesto saying, look, this is how you got to write. It should be short to the point, fun, uh, techy, et cetera, et cetera. And then he put together a little party and I think it was like 30 people. And then the next time he got this huge crowds you didn't know who these people are so it was uh, the the very sort of sought after story what everybody wants to hear when uh, you know people um, kind of build a startup by serendipity you, you put something mm -hmm. together and it starts but uh, as you look back I'm sure uh, a lot of things when when you climb a mountain and you've succeeded in creating I mean the, the business looks really wonderful but when you look down from uh, some sort of a vintage point of years or a couple of years or a few years um, I, I'm sure you could you could see certain things that didn't work out the way you thought they would uh, would you care to share some stories where you either you made a mistake or you thought you made a mistake and eventually it wasn't really a mistake or there was some major challenge and back then you felt oh my god you know the world is gonna come crushing and we're gonna close and right now you're looking back and saying hey you know we handled it oh i have so many stories <laughs> <laughs> Bad. but i think the biggest mistake that i made was um, my business partner and i we were accepted into a tech incubator program it was called the founder institute oh, and great. we we entered the founder institute with three-day rule our big idea and we were met with a lot of unhappy advisors they said Get out of the dating space. It's too saturated. We don't believe you can succeed. Why don't you launch another company instead? And we had, I quit my job as a television producer. My business partner quit her job as an attorney. And here we were ready to launch a dating company and nobody believed in us. So we wanted to continue on in the Founder Institute and we trusted these advisors. So we shut Three Day Rule down and we decided to launch another company. At the time, um, it was called Let's Do, and it brought people together over dinners. Um, and we were able to sell out. The company was successful. We finished the Founder Institute. We had about 50 people that started the Founder Institute with us, and we were two of eight to graduate. So we went through the whole process, and after we realized, this isn't something we're passionate about. Why don't we go back to dating? Um, but we learned major lessons in that. One, we blew our life savings to build this dating site, or this, um, like, it was like a, it was kind of similar to Grub with us, if you know that company. We blew our life savings. We launched so fast. We didn't really look at the margins. The margins were so small. It was really difficult to scale. And we just weren't passionate about it. So we ultimately went back and we revived Three Day Rule and we were able to scale that. But I really wish looking back that I had just followed my gut and followed what I was passionate about. And I think I'm the one or, you know, we were the ones that found there was something missing in the market. So we were the experts. We should have just listened to ourselves and our gut. I, I I think it's really always uh, such a great suggestion, you know, whatever the, the, the smart asses of the world tell you, you know, to do or not to do, really look into your heart and into your passion and do it, which you're happy to be doing. Uh, a question that we traditionally ask everybody, and I know you're unprepared, but everybody else is unprepared. Any books that are business related and maybe, if you wish, a book or two that are not necessarily business related, maybe fiction mm -hmm. or nonfiction? Um, currently, I'm reading Disrupt You. It's by Jay Samet. 
Um, and he actually has been an advisor for a three-day role, and I really look up to him, so I'm enjoying that book. I remember reading Do More Faster when I first started. I really liked that. Um, I think it's called Venture Deals, something it's um, by the, the guys that wrote, that created Techstars. That was helpful. Now I just read a lot of relationship books. So I don't know how many people sure. will find that interesting. <laughs> um, if I may ask this really stupid question, because I'm not really as, as much of a specialist in the area as you are, what do you think about the uh, men are from Mars, women are from Venus? Is it outdated? Did it, you know, does it matter? Well, men and women definitely operate very differently. I haven't read that book in so long, but <laughs> I know through interviewing men, they're so simple, and they typically ask for three things when they come to us, and then women come with a list of 75. So we spend a lot of time <laughs> narrowing the list down. Do you really need broad shoulders? Are you sure you need perfect teeth? In 70 years, is that going to matter to you? Um, our men are just so easy. So we love working with both men and women, but men are definitely easier to work with. <laughs> I absolutely love this tagline. Men are so easy. This would be this would be like a great book or you know, great blog. Men are easy. You know, <laughs> they are. Yeah, they know what they know. want. And they almost <laughs> all want the same things. If we were pets, I think we would be on top of <laughs> among among the best pets uh, to keep. Um, another question I wanted to ask you, I, I actually did hear uh, about your company from lots of people before we were interviewing it, and I think some were clients, some read something about you guys, so you, you're a pretty well-known brand, uh, definitely, lots of people talking about it. A uh, question to you, you, you're definitely, my understanding is that you're right now growing, and without asking you to, dis to disclose any secrets at all, uh, what's ahead? Uh, I, I, you're, you guys, are you planning to continue scaling? Are you going internationally? Are you working? Certainly, don't tell us any secrets. Uh, are you working on any exciting apps, any wonderful functionality? What would make a company, and this is a question coming from a venture capitalist, what would make a company that is pretty successful, that is rather well known, that has a, a great number of very satisfied, very happy customers go on to the next and next and next stage? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a lot of really exciting things that are coming up. Currently, we're in six cities. So we're LA, New York, San Francisco, Chicago, Boston, and DC. And our goal is to launch 21 additional cities in the US. Um, so we figured out the formula, we know how to launch, we break even pretty quickly, and we have that down. So we're, we'll be opening up additional cities. And we're also working on an app, which I can't tell you much about, but it will allow us to scale and give people that are in cities will never be in access to three-day roll. An another question that I just thought about a couple of minutes ago, as you guys grow and I looked at the list of uh, you have instead of saying the team you, you say matchmakers and if there may be uh, some other members of the team that are not matchmakers uh, it seems like uh, at least in pictures everybody is happy etc uh, how big are you guys in terms of the team are you going to grow as far as the team size and how again without telling us any secrets what makes your team happy? What makes your team function as, not necessarily really a family, but really as a, a community of people, a group of people who are doing something together and that who are happy, hopefully reasonably happy working mm -hmm. with each other? I think that's the best part about our, our company is our team. Everybody loves working for Three Day Rule and we're really supportive of each other. So a lot of people look at our team and we have mostly women. We're working on it. We're trying to hire some male matchmakers. But we have um, right now 16 female matchmakers across the country. And a lot of people wonder if it's catty, if you know it's a tough environment to work in. But actually, it's the most pleasant environment I've ever worked in because we all left corporate America to follow our passion. So the matchmakers were investment bankers, execs at Google. They worked at Facebook. And they all left to do something meaningful. So we're all coming from the same place, and we're really supportive of each other. So it's the most wonderful environment to work um, in. And plus, we have the best jobs. We get to go to events and recruit singles. You know, one day we're chasing a fire truck to get firemen, and then we're crashing. You know, a finance event. We get to do something different every day. 
So we've had a blast. And as we open up cities, we'll just continue to grow. So we go from about 16 matchmakers to a little over 100 and hopefully the next few years. Tell you seem like a genuinely very happy person. Um, and uh, besides the obvious fact that I, definitely you're doing something that you love and you're pursuing your passion, um, tough philosophical question. What makes, besides being in love and being loved back, what makes a person happy? I think it really comes from being happy with yourself. You know, once you're happy with yourself and you are accomplishing the things that you'd like to accomplish, then you can find love and, you know, then you can find a job that's fulfilling, but it really comes from within. So a lot of people will come to us even as clients and we're not ready to take them on. They have a lot of work to do on their own before they're really ready to take the next step. So it's just figuring out what makes each person happy individually and really focusing on that. And speaking of happiness and unhappiness, lots of people consider venture capital uh, sort of the dark side. Being a VC myself, I even have a t-shirt that says dark side and has Darth Vader. So um, <laughs> are you ever planning to talk to uh, the, the kind of Darth Vaders of the world? <laughs> we are just starting to <laughs> right now. So we're, we're heading out to raise around, and I hope they're all as nice as you are. <laughs> So um, a special shout to those of our listeners, and there are quite a few of you who are venture capitalists. Uh, pay attention. Here is a great, um, hopefully fast-growing, uh, very, very much capable, I think, of scaling um, company with a proven uh, business model and proven ability to grow. Um, speaking, moving into business and talking about business. Um, Startuppers, very often when you talk to startuppers, almost all of them start with a fantastic idea. They uh, gather a team, a team works together happily, unhappily, uh, they create something. And then the first challenge happens, which is uh, ability to get the first customers. Then the second one, ability to monetize, ability to scale a little bit more. What have what have been the main challenges? What have been uh, so far? Uh, what, what kinds of challenges do you think you encountered that maybe were unusual uh, as far as you know typical startup pass forward? Because I'm sure pass you know growth pass because I'm sure you have lots of startup friends. What are the hurdles that you want to? talk about with other entrepreneurs because thousands of entrepreneurs uh, will be listening to this and what advice would you give them or what different advices would you give them? I have so many. <laughs> Tough <laughs> questions, yes. Um, choose whichever. <laughs> I think, I mean, it, it's a couple parts. One, through the business, our biggest challenge has been getting the free members to match with our clients. So we have a lot of demand to become clients, but we won't take somebody on unless we have all the matches that we need for them. And so with very little marketing, we have barely spent any money on marketing to date. We spent about less than $30,000 to grow this company. Um, so we really focused on quality because the majority of our clients come from word of mouth. So we've spent a lot of time on the customer experience and making sure that the people that do sign on as clients have enough matches and have a really great experience because they're the ones that are going to be spreading the word. So I think customer acquisition for us has been a challenge, just being scrappy and not having a ton of funding. On a personal level, I had a, uh, an interesting experience a couple years ago, and actually I'm going through it again now, fundraising while pregnant. Um, it's... I think actually this time around it's going to be a little bit easier, but when I was first starting the company and we were raising our seed round, I was, uh, we had two women, we had no technical co-founder, I was newly pregnant and everybody was telling me don't do it, hide your pregnancy, um, So, which is what I did. And so this time I'm fundraising, very openly pregnant and we'll see what happens, but it's it is something that I think women have to go through in the startup community and I'm hoping that I can be a role model for other women to be able to have a family and a company. 
Uh, I must say that uh, having lived in California for a few years, I thought I heard everything, but uh, openly pregnant is a fantastic, <laughs> <laughs> a fantastic expression. I think you're, you should give everybody listening another great idea for a book or a movie, openly pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of catchphrases, um, uh, forgive me, I'm a man and I'm a simple person, but when I heard Three Day Rule, and, and I think it's an awesome, uh, it's an awesome name. Uh, what comes to mind, and I don't want to sound douchier than uh, <laughs> than most men are, but uh, among some really, really bad men, really, really bad men, quite a few of whom are my good friends, there is this three-day rule, which is for three days after a date, you should not call. So uh, can you talk a little bit about the name? <laughs> that is exactly what the rule is. And actually, we got the name from Swingers, the movie, yes. years ago. Um, I was really reluctant to name the company something with love or Cupid, so we named it Three Day Rule. And we do not believe in the rule. And even as years have gone by, we you know times have changed. Everybody's texting. There really are no rules anymore. But we like the name. People definitely think it's you sleep with someone after three days, and that's definitely not what it is. <laughs> Uh, one of the challenges, uh, I'm sure, or, or I, I think, I'm not sure, one of the challenges of um, running a business in a segment like, uh, for example, games or a segment like dating is that uh, often people do not realize that this is a serious business and uh, fun as it may be and uh, even I, I'd venture to say risque as it sometimes may, may be, it's dating, um, it's still serious business. So. Um, how are you guys dealing with that? Because I'm, I'm sure if uh, I would tell, and I've done lots of crazy stuff in my life, much crazier than running uh, dating sites, but uh, I, I'm just thinking, you know, telling my mom, hey, mom, I'm running dating sites. She'd be like, oh, God, what kind of job is that for a nice Jewish boy, et cetera. Uh, how are you handling that? Uh, you know, because I'm sure lots of people lack um, understanding of this being quite a serious business. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> fortunately, <laughs> it's easy to recruit the matchmakers because if you go on the site and you see the bios of the women that we're hiring, they went to Harvard and UCLA Anderson. They're very accomplished, so we don't have a problem there. I think as we're growing, you know, I within the company, we look at metrics every day and we treat it like a real business. We have to hit these financial goals. So there's a lot of fun that we have within the company, but we definitely run it like a real business. And we have monthly goals that we have to hit and everybody knows it. So it's great that everybody came from corporate America and they have that background and they also have the ability to have fun in their job. Uh, when, when, you, when, you, when you talk with entrepreneurs, um, one thing, and you just made a reference to that, uh, one thing that's pretty dangerous is when you're in a, uh, quote unquote, uh, quote unquote, accomplished entrepreneur, venture capitalist, a person with exits, people look up to you for, for advice and they're asking you sometimes things that, you know, most people are not too shy about answering. And so everybody loves to recommend, oh, at three day rule, you should do this. Oh, you should do that. Oh, you haven't thought about that. I'm sure you've you hear it every day and you're thinking, okay, yeah, right. But, and you mentioned this ridiculous, I think, advice that people gave you, you know, don't go into dating, you know, go into something else. Uh, but I'm still gonna ask you, uh, what would you advise? What would your main advice is? Probably not one, because I'm sure you can advise quite a few things, but if you want to, to give them just one advice, what would be your advice to entrepreneurs? What is it that, they really should think about? Or what is it that they really should not think or worry mm -hmm. about? I think opinions are data points. And you should listen to what other people have to say. But ultimately, you make the decision for your company and for yourself. I wish that I thought that through a little more over the years. I would give somebody a fun funding deck. And they'd say, oh, you have to change these 10 pages. And then you run around like a chicken with your head cut off. So it is really important to listen to people who have done it before, but ultimately you make the decision for yourself. Uh, for your growth, how important is the viral element? How important is it that people tell each other and bring each other uh, to you? Yeah, it's a tough business because it some in some ways it's inherently private. 
So people aren't on Facebook posting, I signed up with a matchmaker. Uh, so it's important for us to give them a good experience and then they tell their friends. So their company started, I would match a couple people and they would tell 10 of their friends and those people would tell 10 more. Um, so it is viral, but in a more of a private way. Uh, being originally from Russia myself, uh, a question that I wonder about, do you feel that internationally outside of American culture, uh, this is something that would also be appealing? And if yes, are you guys planning to expand internationally? Mm -hmm. Definitely it's appealing internationally. We're focusing on the US right now, but then we, we plan to go international. Um, uh, totally, really fantastic. I'm, you know, listening to everything you're saying, completely agreeing with this. Uh, you have great business. What's your, where do you see, people love to ask this question, but it's not as stupid as it sounds, I, I think. <laughs> Forgive me if it's going to sound stupid. But where do you see yourself after uh, three, day, three days rule, uh, after you either have an IPO or an e exit of some other sort, what's going to be next? I'll probably be an 80-year-old matchmaker. I don't think I'm ever going <laughs> to stop. I really love it. I'm obsessed with matchmaking and the company, so I, I can't really see past it now. This, 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 ladies and gentlemen, is probably the best answer to this question that everybody usually asks. Uh, I, you know, I, I love asking startups, what are you going to do after that? And one of my favorite uh, answers is, you know, I'll do some nonprofit, etc. But I think this is one of the best. Like, whatever is going to happen, I'm even as an eighty-year-old, I'm going to be matching. Um, Talia, anything, any other parting words of wisdom, anything that you want to wish to anybody listening? And, and keep in mind, majority of people listening are entrepreneurs. A lot of them are just starting something. Uh, any good valediction? Well, I will say that I know how much work goes into starting a company. So if any entrepreneurs are single and starting a company, you should sign up for free at 3 Day Rule and we might match you with the love of your life. And it doesn't cost anything and we do all the work for you. Dahlia, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me.